Luke 10 and verse 38. The Gospel of Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. Let's see if we can read through verse 42 in unison all together, not too fast and not too slow. Let's see if we can all keep on the same note. Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee this morning that we can look up to heaven and call Thee Father. Oh, what a glorious privilege it is to be part of the family of God, to have brothers and sisters in the Lord, to have the same blood applied to our hearts that makes us one in Thy family. We thank Thee for Thy Word today. We've been thrilling at the testimonies of how Thou hast spoken through Thy Word when people never heard a message from a pulpit but read the, the written Word of God and Thou didst speak to them and lead them and guide them into the way that they should go. We thank Thee for the faithful ministry of the Holy Spirit. We thank Thee for all that Thou art doing for us and for what You're going to do. Lord, our confidence is in Thee. Our faith looks up to Thee. We're not only believing Thee for now, but we're believing Thee to meet the needs of this camp meeting today and tomorrow and through the end of this camp. Lord, give us, we pray Thee, a gracious outpouring of Thy Spirit and Thy name which is worthy shall have all the praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Serving Jesus Christ is a vital part of Christian living, but there is one thing which is even more important than being engaged in service, namely that of sitting at the feet of Jesus. In the little village of Bethany, located about two miles southeast of Jerusalem, lived a man and his two sisters whom Jesus loved dearly. It is not clear from the Scripture whether Lazarus, Martha, and Mary had separate homes of their own or whether the three lived together. We do not really know if any of them had ever been married or were married at the time of this Scripture writing. But in reading the various Gospel accounts concerning Lazarus and his sisters, there are several things with which I am deeply impressed. First of all, I notice that they were devout followers of the Lord God. There just wasn't any question mark about it. Everybody knew that this brother and his two sisters were devout, pious uh, people who followed after God. Isn't it good to meet people year after year after year who, if anything, they have deepened their walk. They love the Lord more now than they ever did before. They're following hard after God. I tell you, there's some folk that you have question marks about and you get troubled about, but there are others that you just know they're truly uh, deep blue serving God. Praise the Lord. Now this man and his sisters believed 
that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. They were loved and esteemed among their many Jewish friends. Their home, or homes as the case may have been, was always open to Jesus. They loved Him so much. Apparently, Jesus and His disciples had a standing invitation to come to their home and stay for any length of time. I tell you, since I found the Lord Jesus, and as some have already said, those whom we thought were really our friends dropped us mighty quick when we took up our cross and began to follow the Lord. But I found that He gave me far more friends and true friends until I think I could go just about anywhere across the country and find a place where I would be welcome to lay my head at night and get a meal or two if I needed it from a Christian brother in the Lord. It is likely that Jesus and His disciples spent the nights during the early part of Passion Week in Bethany with Lazarus and Martha and Mary after those long and hectic days in Jerusalem. Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were very kind and hospitable people. The warmth of their friendship must have been attractive to Jesus Christ. It afforded Him a place of safety and rest at a time when many were seeking to take His own life. In the meeting of His many human needs, Jesus was blessed to have had a haven in this Bethany home. Friends, I suppose we take it for granted often but we ought to thank God continually if we have a Christian home. Some of us didn't grow up in sight. My father and mother were not Christians, and often it was anything but a haven. I remember times when dad and mom didn't talk to each other for days on end. Oh, what an awful atmosphere to grow up in. But it's wonderful to have a Christian home, isn't it, where Christ is the head, and where the spirit of love flows. Thank God. And Jesus, when He was here upon earth as the incarnate Son of God, had human needs, just like we do. And He found them met again and again from Christian friends, followers of God. In the Scripture, which I have read this morning, we see Jesus and His disciples making their way to Bethany to the home of his friends one more time. Luke alone records the account before us. The story is quite short, but it is packed full of meaning. Lazarus is not mentioned in this story. The spotlight is simply focused upon the two sisters. The most striking thing about them is the clear-cut difference in the way each of them responded to the visit of Jesus. And I would like to suggest to you this morning that among all professing Christians, probably these two sisters become symbolic of the way people respond to the coming of Jesus Christ. Let us first of all turn our attention upon Martha. And I'm not sure that I'm going to preach. We'll just have a little devotional lesson if that's all right. Probably, though, I won't get too far but what I have to preach. I have told my students again and again, and I've been out of the classroom for some time now, but since I've normally always taught Bible and theology, I've told them the first day right out flat that if they didn't want any preaching in class, the time to drop the class was today. Because I said, there's no way that I know to teach the Bible without applying it to me and then applying it to you. And that means you've got to point your finger out once in a while when you apply it. I tell you what, the most spiritual students I've ever had have said to me again and again, Brother England, don't stop preaching to us. Keep right on. But occasionally, in fact, quite often, I got discouraged because I saw some people that just didn't like it. Oh, they looked so hard at me. But then I read in Ezekiel where the Lord said, don't let their faces scare you. I'll make yours harder than theirs. <laughs> and then somebody would come up and say, Brother England, don't stop. Keep right on preaching to us. Praise the Lord. I tell you what, it, the Word of God needs to be applied. It's not something for academic uh, infiltration, but it's to be worked out. And what God works in, we better work out. Praise the Lord. 
And so I'm not sure where I'll end up at, but let's come back to the lesson at any rate and see if I can stay up here behind the pulpit, Brother Sheridan. I've had a phone call and several interruptions. I told Brother Gray to be ready to preach this morning in case I couldn't get it all together. But let's look, first of all, upon Martha, the one who served the Lord Jesus. Martha is especially identified as a hostess. According to verse 38, she received Jesus into her house. Perhaps this suggests that she was the older of the two sisters and the owner of the house. Or it may simply mean that it was Martha's turn to so serve as hostess if Lazarus and Mary had their own home. Martha is also described as a very active hostess. Verse 40 declares, she was cumbered about much serving. One translation gives it like this. She was distracted with all her preparation. Yet another gives it thus. She was busy and distracted in attending to her guests. You know, some hostesses get so uptight and get so nervous when company comes that they're just hurrying here and there, and they can't enjoy any part of it. Martha had a little bit of that kind of a problem. Not only was she an active hostess, she was also an agitated hostess. It really frustrated her that she had to do most, if not all the work. So she came right directly to Jesus and said, Lord, dost thou not care? that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Well, it sounds to me like uh, Martha was disturbed, not only with Mary, who was in another room, sitting there at the feet of Jesus, but it sounds like she's a little bit disturbed with Jesus, doesn't it? That he didn't say anything to Mary, that he was he was allowing her to sit there and letting Martha do the work. My friend, have you ever been frustrated with your brother or sister, boy or girl, <laughs> kitchen worker, <laughs> janitor? Because they let you do about everything that needed to be done. It just seems to me over the years that I've observed that about 95, this is probably exaggerated for emphasis, but about 95% of the people are willing to allow 5% to do 100% of the work. <laughs> and somebody has said, if you want a job done, get the busiest person you know to do it. Everybody else is too busy. They can't do it. Oh, I remember one of my girls. We have five children. We have two families. Our oldest children are about 27, 25, 23, and 21. They were nicely patterned, uh, two girls and two boys. And I said for years that my quiver was full. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them, but mine was full. And then 13 years after the last of the four came along, we had another little one. And I had to squeeze or move the arrows out and make room for Kristen. But out of the older ones, out of the four, uh, I've had uh, one of the girls and one of the boys come to me on more than one occasion and say, Dad, it's not fair. It's just not fair. <laughs> I have to end up doing about everything. And I would say, yeah, I know, I know. Life isn't fair. And that's true. It, it's not fair. Who said it was going to be fair? I said that's the way it was when I grew up. I had an older brother who didn't do anything but eat and sleep at home. And he was on his way. That's all he did. And I said I loved to stay home after I got saved. And I loved to trim trees and mow the grass and work in the garden and even help wash dishes, dry dishes, without mom saying anything. I said, uh, don't worry about it. But people do, don't they? And it kind of bugs us. <laughs> I have to admit that. 
I remember a work day we had at Allegheny Wesleyan College when I was teaching there. It could, be, it could have been at GBF, but it just happened to be at Allegheny Wesleyan. And one guy was just standing around watching us, watching us work. Now, some people are good at that. Well, they're gifted at watching. And I, uh, I try to work a little wit in. Sometimes people don't catch it right away. They're a little slow. But... Uh, I said, it looks like this fellow's trying to fulfill the prophecy that says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. I think he had both hands in his pockets. It does make us rather frustrated. She was frustrated. After all, she wanted to get a good meal for Jesus. She wanted it to be at its best. And she had to do almost all the work. I think I hear someone saying, but... Preacher, is it not important for the followers of Jesus Christ to give themselves to serving Him? Are we not saved to serve Jesus? My friends, the fact is, that's right. The Bible clearly teaches that we are saved to serve. Oh, God is looking for people to serve Him. In fact, the fields are so white, the work is so vast, the workers are so few that he's bid us to pray that he might send forth workers and laborers. Jesus said, whosoever will be chiefest among you shall be servant of all. Isn't that something? And yet I don't see people banging doors down to be chiefest in this kind of setting. I'd like to be the greatest. Can I carry your suitcase. Can I shine your shoes? Oh no. R.A. Torrey came back from a preaching expedition apparently, a weekend meeting, meeting or something when he was president of Moody and when he got back some students were sitting around and he asked one of the men if he would do an errand for them. And that young fellow way back there about the first part of the century, he had the audacity to say, who do you think I am? Your servant? My. I mean, a Bible school guy. Another fella sitting nearby overheard it, and he said, Dr. Torrey, I'll be glad to do it for you. Oh boy, what a difference in attitude and spirit. What's your attitude? If your pastor asks you to do something, how do you respond? It's not really surprising that the other fella who said, Sir, I'll be glad to do it, later became the president of Moody Bible Institute. He wanted to be a servant. It's the people that want to be behind the big desk and be somebody that never amount to anything because they're not willing to get down low enough to be a servant. So it's really proper to be a servant. Immediately preceding our scripture lesson is the parable of the Good Samaritan. In this story, Jesus teaches us that our neighbor is anybody in need. Here the emphasis is upon serving, upon giving oneself to help anyone who is in need. Throughout all the Bible, we are taught by exhortation and example to do good to all men and especially to those of the household of faith. But my dear friend, a problem arises when we get our priorities out of place. That's where the danger comes in when we get things turned around. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. That really narrows the priorities down, doesn't it? In his comments, Jesus is drawing a clear contrast between the many things that Martha had been engaged in and the one thing that Mary had chosen to do. Notice the tenderness of Jesus toward Martha. He doesn't say, woman, woman, but he calls her by her name. Oh, don't you see the tenderness there? Martha, Martha. I'm so glad that when the Lord sees we get our priorities out, he doesn't come along with a big club and hit us over the head. But he's so tender, isn't he? I like that. The Holy Ghost is gentle and pulls upon our heartstrings. But he's so faithful to us, he'll put his finger right on the sore spot. And that's exactly what he did with Martha. Her priorities were out of order. 
for she had failed to make the best choice. Let us turn now our attention to look at Mary for a little while, the one who sat at Jesus' feet. What a contrast. Martha is the server. Mary is the sitter. Mary appears to have been more reserved than Martha in her makeup. At least John 11.20 would suggest it. For here we see Martha arising and running to see Jesus as he made his way toward Bethany a couple days after Lazarus had passed away, or about four days later, while Mary remained seated in the house. It is probably not fair to conclude that Mary did not help her sister with any of the preparations for the meal, for you'll notice the little word also in verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet. That's suggesting she did more than just sit there. I think she helped with everything she knew to do in the early part, and when everything was about ready, she slipped off to be with Jesus. My friend, I don't think the inner circle disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, were favorites of the Lord Jesus. I'm sure he was no respecter of persons at all. I think the reason they're known as the inner circle disciples is because they chose to be with Jesus when others enjoyed going off for a walk somewhere or doing something that was perfectly legitimate, but these fellas like to stay near to Jesus. And I tell you what, we're just as spiritual today, every one of us, just as spiritual as we want to be. No use making excuses for it at all. I have as much God as I want to have. If I want to have more, then I make sacrifices and push other things out of the way. If I'm satisfied, and you know it's just about like graduate work. One of the great scholars, when you get into graduate work, they don't talk about brains so much. They don't talk about IQs and that kind of thing. They say if you want to do well, then you work hard. <laughs> if you want to get an A, you do this much work. Lots and lots of work. If you're satisfied with a B, you don't do as much. If you want to see, and that's one, what one of our professors said, if you want an A in this class, do everything I have on the syllabus. If you don't, do three of the four. If you want to see, then do two. <laughs> and really, our spiritual report cards are about the same way. They really are. She wanted to be with Jesus. Mary's response and relationship to Jesus were neither accidental nor coincidental. She deliberately chose on purpose to do what she did. My friend, there are three things recorded about her actions. Think about it for a little while with me. First of all, we are told that she sat at Jesus' feet. I don't think there is anything meritorious in itself in a sitting posture. But I think in this setting that it suggests an attitude of submission. If I'm going to get anything from the Lord Jesus, I must be utterly submitted to Him. I must be as clay in the potter's hand. I must not tell Him what to do. Even as the clay doesn't tell the potter, I must come utterly submitted to Him. In reading a few chapters prior to the text, I was amazed to find at least two other references to those who sat at Jesus' feet. In Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, there's a beautiful account about Jesus being invited to the house of a Pharisee by the name of Simon for a meal. And while Jesus was there enjoying that good meal, a woman heard that he was there. She had heard so much about him, and like some who have testified here, and like myself, knew nothing about him for so many years. She made her way to that home, though she had not been invited, and slipped in and stood near the feet of Jesus. She was so moved upon, she began to weep. She simply identified as a sinner. No name is given. But she came with an alabaster box of ointment. She stood behind him near his feet and she began to weep. And as she wept, she knelt down and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and took her long hair and wiped his feet 
and then took that ointment and spread it upon his lovely feet. And then she kissed his feet again and again and again. But friend, behind all those external actions was a penitent and a believing heart. For she not only wept and wiped her tears, Jesus spoke to her and said, Thy sins are forgiven. Oh, praise the Lord. I tell you, Simon had a problem like some of our people. He had a real problem when the lady came in. And Jesus allowed her to weep and wipe his feet with her tears. He had a real problem. He said within himself, if this man were really a prophet, he would know she's a sinner. And he wouldn't allow that. Oh, he should have known better. Jesus knew what he was thinking. And Jesus said, Simon, <laughs> ever since I come into your house, you never gave me any water. You never washed my feet. But this woman doesn't cease to weep and wash them. You never anointed my head, but she's anointing my feet. He said, I have somewhat to say to thee. The creditor had two debtors. One owed him a great vast sum of money, another not so much. Because neither of them had anything to pay, he frankly forgave them all. To whom do you think there was greater love? And he said, I suppose the one for whom most was forgiven. Oh, I'm glad for those who never go deep in sin, but I tell you what, I think sometimes those who've gone so deep, though there's nothing to boast of in that at all, I believe there's a deep love, as our brother testified last night, off of drugs, out of an awful life of sin. Thank God for that forgiveness. Jesus said, Thy faith hath saved thee. Praise the Lord. In chapter 8, verses 26 through 39 of Luke's Gospel, he records a miracle that took place in Gadara. Jesus and his disciples had gone across the Sea of Galilee, and during that tempestuous storm, Jesus calmed the waves. And when they landed uh, at the coast toward Gadara, they were met by a demon-possessed man who lived out among the tombs, much like an animal, for no man could tame him. They tried chains and, and bindings, but he broke them with that awful power of Satan. But Jesus cast out the many demons from the man. And Luke tells us that after the demons, the devils were cast out, this man was found sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Oh, I like that, don't you? What a beautiful picture of one who has been converted, born again into the family of God. Friend, the most natural place to find a newborn babe is sitting at the feet of Jesus. I mean, it's as natural as breathing. It really is. Learning about Him and possessing His right mind. I remember after I was saved at age 14, my mother said I would surely lose my mind. She said I'd probably end up in Maslin, Ohio. That's where they had a mental institution. I used to hear that back in the 50s, but it looks like I haven't heard that kind of thing for a long time. What's happened? Oh, we're so calm and cool, collected today. Nobody looks like they're gone off on the deep end at all, does it? Well, the fact of the matter is I did lose a mind. I lost my sinful mind. And I found the mind of Christ. And no wonder sinners get all disturbed about that. They say you're going to lose your mind. Well, we already lost the mind they have. And they're not comfortable to be around us. No wonder. In the Gospel of John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we are told about Jesus and his disciples going to Bethany six days before the Passover. And this is getting down close to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Lazarus is at this meal, and Martha is doing the serving. She liked to work. She was a good worker. And I would like to say, thank God for good workers. I'd like to say that because it does need emphasize. 
The Bible is clear in saying, six days shalt thou labor. Well, that's enough to put a lot of holiness people to, to conviction. Six days shalt thou labor. Well, thank you for the few amens. But I mean, God made us up to be workers, not sit around. There's so much work to do. God made us up to labor. Praise the Lord. I don't believe you can fulfill the will of God without giving yourself to labor. I'd rather die young, burning out, than to be lazy and sitting around. The fact of the matter is, I believe you'll live longer if you work hard. Work never killed anybody that I know of. Worry does, but not work. My father-in-law is 80 years old, big, callous hands. He's never been sick a day in his life, all day in bed. I don't know how many sheep he's shorn this year already. I'm glad Miss Peabody didn't retire at 65. I'd have never had her. She was about 88 when I was a freshman. <laughs> oh, I'm glad she didn't retire. She's hot till she's about 94. Doesn't that sound glorious? Does to me. Brother Marsh didn't retire. I'd have never had him. Yeah. Brother England, you're not with it. Man, don't you know? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Friend, I tell you what, the happiest people I've met that aren't even Christian are workers. Hard workers. Because God made us up that way. So I want to give a fair balance. So here's Martha doing the serving, and thank God for the workers. But here comes Mary. She has a pound of very expensive perfume, and she anoints the feet of Jesus with it. It's simply an external expression of the deep devotion she has toward her Lord and Savior. How much Mary loved Jesus, and therefore counted it a great privilege to anoint his feet. My friend, when we give to the work of God, when we give ourselves to sitting at Jesus' feet, it's simply a token that we love Him, we adore Him, we love to worship Him. The second thing recorded about Mary in the text is this. She heard His word, also in verse 39. Mary had an ear to hear and a desire to embrace and obey the words of Christ. Surely the Lord has much to say to me and to you if he can only get our attention long enough to get to our inner ear, not just the outer ear. It's amazing how we can hear outwardly and yet not perceive. We can see with our physical eye but never perceive with our mind. We can hear with our outer ear and yet never get it to the inner ear. I remember one day in class I made a certain announcement about three times. And there were still some that never got it. About halfway through the class, somebody raised their hand and asked the very thing that I'd already mentioned three times. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty much convinced that we hear what we want to hear. My wife speaks, and if I'm not real interested in what she's talking about, I don't listen too well. I don't tune in. I don't turn up the dial. And I say, huh? We really hear what we want to hear, don't we? <laughs> there are so many voices clamoring for my attention and your attention these days. May God help us to sit low at the feet of Jesus until we can hear His Word. Friend, if we're not careful, we'll be so active. We'll just be doing and going and saying, and we're working for the Lord all the time. But oh, how we need to sit and listen to him. I'm speaking to myself. The third thing Mary did is summed up by Jesus in this, these words. One thing is needful. Mary hath chosen this good part. In one translation, the first part of the verse is rendered thus. Only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. The latter portion is translated by one version like this. The part that Mary hath chosen is best. My friends, in life there are many things that we can do that are good. 
But if you put all the good things that are right and proper before you and then begin to narrow them down, some things are better than others, right? And out of all those that are better, you can narrow it down until there's one that's superlative or best. And my friend, for those of us who have taken up our cross to follow Jesus, the highest choice we can ever make is to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of Him. No Christian is greater than his prayer life. Oh, that puts me under conviction. My friend, I, I tell you what, we live in the fast lane, don't we? And we who are on Bible college campuses seem to be on an awful fast treadmill. We're just going all the time. It seems like day and night. And if I'm not careful, I get my priorities out of line. And I've got to go back and get a hold of myself and say, look, you can't do that. You can't do it. You've got to sit at his feet and take time to hear. But, you know, I think another problem that I face and I, I assume that most of us face is that prayer becomes a one-way street. I mean to say that if our spiritual report card is going to be marked by the amount of talking we do, we probably would score pretty high. But if we sit at Jesus' feet, we need to have an ear to hear and let him do the talking to us. Have you ever been on the telephone and the person on the other line is just talking all the time? You can't hardly get a word in edgewise. That gets frustrating, doesn't it? And I wonder if our Heavenly Father ever gets frustrated. Here we are. Lord, I need this and that. And, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm for fervent prayer. But we do all the time. We told the Lord everything. But what, is, what did He want to say? Oh, may He help me. My friend, it's not simply a matter of choosing whether we should either sit at Jesus' feet or be serving Him. The either-ors are really not good. One of my professors in theology said that the little theological demon, as he called it, the little demon in theology is the either-or. And I think that's about right. It's either this or that. Most of the time it's not either-or, it's both and. It's not a matter of whether we're just to sit or just to serve. No, no. He wants us to both sit at His feet and also serve Him. Praise the Lord. He intends that they go together. But my friend, we cannot serve Him well until first we have sat at His feet and learned of Him. The songwriter has said it so well. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Oh, what words I hear him say. Happy place, so near, so precious. May it find me there each day. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, I would look upon the path. For his love has been so gracious, it has won my heart at last. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, where can mortal be more blessed? There I lay my sins and sorrows, and when weary, find sweet rest. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, there I love to weep and pray. While I from his fullness gather grace and comfort every day. Bless me, O oh my Savior, bless me as I sit low at thy feet. O oh, look down in love upon me. Let me see thy face so sweet. Give me, Lord, the mind of Jesus. Make me holy as he is. May I prove I've been with Jesus, who is all my righteousness. A few months ago, it was my privilege, and I come to a close, my privilege to be in St. Louis at a convention, the annual convention for the American Association of Bible Colleges, one of, the, one of the guest speakers was Dr. Anthony Coppola, who is nationally and even internationally known as a Christian 
sociologist, teaches at Eastern College in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, has written several books, a very fine man, one of the most powerful messages I've ever heard on the indictment of materialism for professing Christians. Dr. Campola appears on Dr. Dobson's programs on occasion. Some of you have heard him there, I'm sure. A very fine gentleman. And in the, in the midst of his sermon, he told us that he attends a black church in, in urban Philadelphia. He has a great burden for the poor people, the unfortunate, those of the minority classes. And he said in, his, in the black church where he attends, and I think he's one of the pastors there, an assistant pastor, he said that they had a very special service for a number of graduates, both high school and college graduates. It must be a large church. I think there were 40 graduates, black young men and women, whom they were honoring on a given Sunday morning. They were among, he said, some of the brightest minds among the black community. And as they had all those young men and ladies stand up to give them due honor, the pastor came to preach his message. And he said to those fine graduates, he said, you young people are going to die someday. He said, you don't think you're going to die, but you're going to die. And they're going to put you beneath the sod someday. And he said, uh, when that day comes, it's going to make a difference whether you have just a title or a testimony. And he said, my pastor is only my pastor could. Went through from Genesis to Revelation in about ten minutes. And he said, now Pharaoh had a title. But he said, Moses had a testimony. And he said, Jezebel, she had a title. But Elijah had a testimony. And when you come to die, what are they going to put on your stone? You were a professor. You were a PhD. You were a president or a vice president. If you just have a title and not a testimony, where are you going to be? He said, when you die, they're going to take you out. They're going to bury you beneath the spot. And when they bury you, they're going to go back to the church and eat potato salad. Well, that's about right, isn't it? Somewhere, somewhere, they're going to eat potato salad. But I tell you, friend, when we've run the race, when we've come clear to the end, it's not going to matter what degrees we have or what kind of titles what group we belong to, oh no. But I have a feeling that about everything on that final day is going to be based on whether I've been sitting at the feet of Jesus where I could learn of Him and make my race all the way through to that final city. I'm asking Brother Sheridan to come. He's going to sing for us. Brother and Sister Sheridan are going to sing. We didn't have that song in your hymnal sitting at the feet of Jesus.